Welcome to episode 13 of Talking Prisoner Presents. We have TV royalty with us today. This guest has been in Home and Away for almost 30 years and is currently the longest serving female member. Our guest has also appeared in films and TV shows, including The Flying Doctors, Skirts, Street Angels, Seven Deadly Sins, Sky Trackers, and also in 2014, took part in Dancing with the Stars. In 2021, she released her autobiography, Me, Myself and Irene. Of course, we are talking to Lynn McGranger, who plays Irene Roberts in Home and Away. Welcome to Talking Prisoner. Thank you, Matt. Nice to be here. Thank you. Yeah, what an honour to have you on. Thank you so much. I know you're really busy, but thanks for taking the time to speak with us. My pleasure. Yeah, the fans have gone nuts when we made the announcement on our Facebook page. So, oh, that's <laughs> lovely. That's lovely. <laughs> yeah. Now, before we get into your career, can we just learn a little about your life growing up? Where did you grow up as a child? Well, I grew up in Sydney. Um, I was uh, born in the eastern suburbs to Audrey and Bruce McGranger, the eld oldest of two daughters. And uh, we lived in uh, Bondi Junction for the first 18 months, two years of my life. And then uh, we moved to Guy Mere in Sydney South and then to Miranda. And then my dad was an accountant in Coles. So we, we moved around quite a bit. Oh, Coles as in not the supermarket, but oh, okay. Coles as in a department store back in that, those days. Oh, back then. Okay. Um, and uh, so then we went down to Melbourne for 13 months and came back to Miranda. So basically grew up around the southern suburbs, moved to the St George area in Sydney, um, around Brighton, La Sands, Botany Bay. And then um, after that, I was sort of went to the Blue Mountains, jo joined up with the theatre group, um, went down. Uh, no, before I did that, actually, I went down to Wagga to Teachers College. And uh, I suppose, you know, wet my acting toes, so to speak, down there, yep. got a taste for it and, uh, and then uh, taught for a little while, not very long. I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> and um, then, uh, yeah, just uh, ended up down in, uh, I was, went to Penrith, did um, part-time acting school in Penrith. And then I... Um, oh, so many years of life and then <laughs> and then um I went down to uh Albury Albury Wodonga and uh where I met my partner my life partner Paul oh, yes. uh and we were involved with the uh, Murray River performing group down there from 84 to 88 went to Melbourne did a bit of stand-up comedy did a bit of um bit of telly plays you know the whole uh, shebang now the stand-up the stand-up comedy was with um the natural Normans, was that right? Yes, with that's Scott, Sally Upton. Wow, yep. what was it like? Linda Gibson. Oh, it was hilarious fun. We just had, I mean, truly, it was one gag. It was a <laughs> bunch of women dressed as men singing really bad sexist songs from the 70s and the, uh, no, from the 70s and the 60s. And uh, we did really well. We, we went to... Edinburgh, we went to, uh, you know, Perth and Mel. Well, we were in based in Melbourne then. Uh, we went to Adelaide and 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 I suppose the, the zenith of our career, even though the lovely Denise Scott wasn't with us because she had babies at home, yep. uh, was the Edinburgh Festival. We were over there with Rachel Berger and um, uh, Colin um, Lane and Frank Woodley um, and another member, they, they were then known as um, oh, Empty Pockets. I can't remember. Isn't that terrible? Anyway, um, there was a group of us and, and the show was called Dog's Breakfast. <laughs> Never was anything more actually named. But we ended up in the final six for the Perrier Award. I mean, it was wow. just bizarre these no hopers from melbourne who are just you know rattling around the stage thinking they were hilarious and um yeah so we we ended up in the final six and that year the famous french circuit it was in in 1989 and in that year or 87 anyway uh it's in the book um i've forgotten now uh but that year the the famous french circus are uh, chaos won. so you know we felt so honored to be yes. even considered 
in that group. It was nuts. It was so fun. Um, one of the highlights, definitely, of my live theatre career. Yeah. Is stand-up comedy something you would have liked to have taken further? Well, um, no. Um, no. <laughs> look, <laughs> I did it. It was a challenge. I think I always equate it to, like, jumping out of a plane or, you know, being in a pit full of snakes. You <laughs> do it, and then once you've done it and survived it, you go, no, what? I don't need to do that again. Yeah. But I actually, I really enjoyed it. But writing your own material is is quite difficult because you know, like I might think I'm hilarious, but other people not so much. So yeah. it it is a tough, tough gig. And luckily, I had people like uh, oh, I don't know. Do you remember? Um, Oh, of course, you would remember uh, lovely Wendy Harmer from the big gig and, and even people like, God rest her soul, Linda Gibson and Denise Scott, who had all already done that kind of thing. Yeah. I had them as, as and Richard Stride, who used to be so Richard Stubbs, Richard Stubbs. Oh, Richard Stubbs, yes. Yes. So funny. He, <laughs> very, very funny. And one of those wonderful comedians that can relate like a camping holiday and everybody everybody gets it everybody finds it hilarious and he never has to swear mm. he was a wonderful you know a, like to watch him perform I really you know aspired to be like that sadly didn't get anywhere near it <laughs> why do you bring up Richard though Richard and his brother Grubby have a, a little segment on 3AW here uh, a local yes yes and they're not even trying. They're just so funny together. They're funny, funny people. And <laughs> I, I always, I always think, think of and thank Richard Stubbs because he was to me like the pinnacle of a fabulous comedian who who doesn't need to swear or be dirty or you know to be grubby. Real pardon the pun <laughs> to, to get a laugh because he's he's just is has that capacity to relate everyday events and make them hilarious so true did you watch ricky gervais's recent stand-up comedy he did on netflix the, the no one? no i didn't what was it like it was oh, i mean he offended everyone it was yes you know it was good <laughs> yeah. see i'm uh, i can say this you know what's he going to do shoot me um i i'm not a great fan because yeah. i i he gets it, it tries to eke his humor from offending other people yes. and that's fine if that's what your jam is but yeah. it's not my cup of tea that's why I, I love people like Richard Stubbs and even people like um uh Tahir you know he's a I don't know if you know his work he's a, um, a Middle Eastern comedian I, I guess here. I just recently saw his work yes and he's just <laughs> funny he's yeah. just Funny, and he talks about stuff that everybody gets and everybody understands. Yeah, a bit about the Greek, the Greek family. Did you see the one about the Greek family? That was no. hilarious because I got I had oh. a Greek friend growing up, and everything he said was true. And it was so funny. true. Yeah. <laughs> see, that's wonderful observation, yeah. and and something that you can identify with, I can identify with, even though we're not Greek, you yeah. know. And that's that is to me what a clever comedian is. I tell you who I really love is um oh what my brain's gone today who's the one that that um that cross dresses is english oh julian clary no no, no oh. definitely not um oh gosh i had my, my I had my second booster yesterday and i think it's affected my brain um i will think of it but he's you'd know who i mean he's yeah. wonderful and does this hilarious thing about um about space and about oh, Star Trek. Oh, anyway, I'll think of it while we're talking. It'll just go yeah. bing. Yeah. Anyway. And some fans probably don't know that, yeah, you were a school teacher at one stage. Yeah. In your life. What was that like? <laughs> Look, you know, it, I just wasn't cut out to be a school teacher. I, I couldn't <clears throat> deal with the red tape. And back then, there was a lot less red tape than there is today. And, and as I say in the book, I was perfectly fine until they brought children into the room and then it all went to hell in a handbasket. I was like, oh. Um, and I guess 
it's a, it's a skill. It's like, I guess, being a great nurse or a great, you know, or a great doctor or, or a, yeah. a pastor or, you know, it's, it's a real skill. And I guess I just wanted the kids to like me. And that's not the way to go. You know, you need to have the kids, sure, like is important, but you want them to respect you yeah. and, to, and to be interested in you and to, be, and to want to learn from you. And you know what? I'm not falsely modest, but I really did not have that ability at all. <laughs> Mercifully, I recognised it early and got the hell out of Dodge. Yeah. And around the same time, I started doing more drama and acting classes. And, you know, I was very blessed because as one subsided, the other one kind of rose up a bit. And that was at the uh, Riverina College of Advanced Education. That's, well, that's where I was. That's where I learned to be a teacher. Oh, okay. And then the um, that, and, but I also kind of, like I said before, I kind of, you know, wet my feet in the acting pool there a bit and realised that it was something I could do and then uh, taught for a little while, not very long at all, and then went to the Q Theatre um, and uh, worked professionally there and then went to part-time drama school. And then after that, went down to the Murray River Performing Group in Albury, Wodonga, where I met my partner. Amazing. Now, I'd love to ask this question for people that have gone through theatre. Did, did theatre set you up for your career, you know, acting oh, and TV? Without a doubt. Yep. Without a doubt. It's funny because a lot of the young ones come on the show and they're like, oh, you know, they want to go and do theatre or go and do movies. But, you know, I've kind of already done that and I and I still love it, believe me. But, you know, a theatre gig's hard and uh, it doesn't pay an awful lot. Um, it's just, uh, and to do it continually, uh, A, it's unbelievably exhausting um, to do the old rep group stuff. So you're rehearsing something in the day and performing something else at night is exhausting. And, and if you've got a family, nigh on impossible. Um, so, but I guess in terms of skill, absolutely. And the, the love, my love of theatre has never left. And every so often I audition for something, you know. Oh, really? I, I, you know, just in the vain hope that I might, get it and if I did get it I probably couldn't do it anyway because I couldn't get time off home and away but it's just nice to keep your feet you know to yeah. kind of keep your fingers in the pie and um, of course as you probably know I do I have done up until COVID pantomime. That was my next question yes. Many years yeah. What's it like um, in the pantomimes? Is it like oh it's so years? fun it's yeah. so fun it's like you're just a big idiot on stage <laughs> Fabulous. And um, I, I guess I started being the fairy godmother in, in Jack and the Beanstalk or the fairy godmother in, in Cinderella. And then as you progress, you go, hang on a minute, the baddie is much, much more fun. Uh, so now these days yeah, I tend to be cast as, you know, the wicked witch in, you know, the, the bad fairy in um, uh, Beauty and the Beast or or the uh, the which in um, Jack and the Beanstalk or the, you know, the, the bad um, the bad fairy in um, Cinderella, all of those things. So that, that's, the, um, that's the role I like and it, it is so much fun. You just, you know. Yeah, you, they are fun. The sky's the limit. You just get away with murder. Yeah, I, I mean, that's my memory of my childhood with my grandma on holidays. She'd always take me to the amateur theatre in Camberwell, the, sorry, the pantomimes, and yes. the old church, and it, it was the best day ever, just watching. Because you're, you know, you're quite young to remember pantomime. That's very, that's very interesting you say that, because my nana, back in the, you know, very early 60s, used to take me to the professional pantomimes wow. in say at the Theatre Royal in Sydney or one of the, I just remember going there and having, you know, the Buttons character would throw lollies out in the audience. Of course, nowadays they won't because they're terrified they'll take somebody's eye out with a fan tail. You know, I've never known anyone who's had their eye taken out with a fan, fan tail, but everyone's so politically correct these days. Um, but that's one of my earliest memories. And then a lot of the younger generation when you talk about pantomime, they go, what's a pantomime? Yes. And then you have, yeah, they just do not, because even though they have tried, I know, 
a few companies have tried to put them on in Australia, either around the June, Jul the July holidays yeah. or at Christmas time, it doesn't quite work because traditionally they're a Christmas thing in England. Yeah. Traditionally. And who wants to take the kiddies to the theatre when it's 40 degrees? Yes. Nobody. <laughs> um, it's the last thing on your mind. And, it, and in July it just loses something because it's not Christmas. Yeah. So they still try and they still, you know, every, so, you know, obviously not during COVID, but every so often one will pop up. Um, and I assume they have a, a certain amount of, of um, uh, you know, success, but there is nothing like in the UK where they're just everywhere yeah, yeah. everything from really amateur like you're saying in the church hall to you know on at the london palladium yeah or at the york opera house or at the hippodrome you know in in that's in huge. liverpool that's just they're everywhere and well, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting the one my grandma took me to was actually run by i'm probably you probably remember this actor was terry gill remember terry gill yes i do yeah. Him and his wife had the one in, in Caulfield for many years. And that's where my grandma took me. And wow. And my wife is still carrying it on to this day. And I actually took my daughter when she was younger to the same one. And it was just, oh. it was amazing to sit there with her, you know, when she was younger. They were giving out That's amazing. And, you know, it and was. Because if she hadn't seen anything like that, she'd be like, what the yeah. hell is going Loved on? Loved it. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's wonderful. It is a great introduction to, to theatre. Um, my very first panto that I went over with Paul and our daughter Clancy was uh, four going on five wow. and she was one of the tinies. So, that you know, they have the dancers. So they have the, the big dancers, then they have the smaller dancers and sometimes they have the babes who are like five, six-year-olds. And I remember she came on stage um, as one of Alice, um, Alice, Fitzsimons. Anyway, in, in um, Dick Whittington, Alice was the uh, was Dick's love interest, and it was Alice's birthday, and she had to come on stage, and she had her own little outfit, and she was with all the other girls and sang "Happy Birthday" to Alice, oh. and her knees were knocking. Like it was her very first time on stage, and her little knees were knocking. But you know, then she went on, and you know, did went to drama school and was singing in a band and I mean now she's a, a Pilates instructor and has wow. the teaching qualities that I never had but um it really it it, it, it impacts kids I think That's, when you take them to yeah. theatre and expose them to that it just opens a whole new world it to does. them you know beyond you know, games on flipping Game Boys and, and yeah. movies and all of that. It's just this whole other world opens up. Yeah, well, I've taken to all the theatre productions in Melbourne, The Wizard of Oz oh, and all them, and she's, you know, she loves it, but she's oh, that's in now. Great. She does ballet, tap dance, all that. Yeah. You know, loves it. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I could reminisce all day about that. I um, know. <laughs> yeah. Now, in 2014, you took part in Dancing with the Stars and you become yes. runner-up. Runner what was that like? Wonderful. I off to you. What? I mean, hideous. What? Hideous. Painful. <laughs> exhausting. Exasperating. All of those. Anything you can think of. Any adjective you can think of. Look, um, I'd always wanted to do it. I just waited till I was 120 years old to do it. Um, now, I just, I, I'd always wanted to do it. And I danced when I was young. I wouldn't call myself like, you know, I was sort of chunky as a teenager. So I was a bit like one of those hippopotamuses on Fantasia, you know, when I was really young. But I always had a sense of rhythm. And I thought, you know what? And I'd seen some of them on there. And I thought, I could do this. This seems okay. Bloody hell. It was honestly, it was... Oh. just exhausting yeah. but wonderful yeah. and for me to make it to the grand final yes. I thought they'd all taken leave of their senses quite frankly <laughs> and all you when you go on those sort of shows all you want is to not be voted off first please don't let me be voted off first don't let me be a real numpty anyway I stayed and I stayed and I stayed and I was always middle of the pack 
Carmelo, who was my uh, professional dancer, and I were always middle of the pack. There was a couple of times we sort of rose to the top and sunk a bit to the bottom, but we, for some reason, they never voted us off. And then so by the time the grand final came around, there was three, and then we thought, oh, that's it, we've done it, we're, we're here, and then, then we'll go. But we didn't. And then there was, you know, the best dancer in the competition, bar none, David Roden, who wasn't uh, an ex-AFL um, player and is now an AFL umpire and has just recently done, uh, you know, a lot of the stars returned. Oh, and, yes. Yeah, yeah to, to do a, uh, you know, all stars, Dancing with the Stars, all stars. And, and Ada, who plays Leah on Home and Away, my friend Ada, she did it, you know, and all these wonderful dancers came back together. Uh, it was mooted in my general direction at one point. I went, nah. <laughs> I'm not doing that again. I'm not doing that again. again. I've done it. It was great. I've done it. Um, It just, it consumes you. And the longer you're on the show, the more time it takes. And it takes, you know, I didn't see Paul or Clancy for about a fortnight towards the end. I was, because I had to be down in Melbourne. We, it was in the days when it was um, filmed down in Melbourne. So we'd be rehearsing down there. I remember the last two weeks, I was down there and then I had to fly up here on the Friday to film Home and Away all day and go straight back again. So Paul and Clancy had to come down to Melbourne to see me. And it wasn't just me, it was everybody, like particularly people that were from interstate. And uh, my feet were like like claws (laughs) because they make you wear these ridiculous shoes. You know, you're not in runners or anything like that. You're in stupid shoes. Um, and uh, I'd have my, you know, rolling my feet on frozen water bottles until my friend Sally Ann Upton, who's a nurse and who was in the Natural Normans with me, rang me and said, are you out of your mind? Don't do that. You should be putting heat on them, uh-huh. not ice, because ice will just shrink the muscles more. Yeah. You know, you need to put a bit of heat on them, alternate it. So anyway, that was the, you know, that was a good piece of advice. Wow. Yeah, because she's but, a nurse, isn't she on that? Yeah, like, she's a nurse on, of, and she was on Neighbours, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, but she's also, of course, done Prisoner. Wentworth, yes. Yes, Reduce. yeah, she's, she's got so many, uh, you know, she wears so many hats. Yeah, yes. yeah, she's a Mary celebrant too, yeah. Wow. But um, it, it, was, it was really tough, Matt, but it was so rewarding and yeah. honestly if if I'd have I think to be honest it wasn't my dancing that got me through I think I was kind of the train wreck that everyone thought was hilarious <laughs> and and also I think uh, you know my personality I guess because it was all like <clears throat> you know teeth and jazz hands <laughs> so nobody really looked at my feet very much Although Todd McKenney, who was one of our judges, still did tell me in the final that I look like a crash test dummy. Oh so, <laughs> and he was right. And he was right. But you know what? It didn't matter because Dave Roden, who was an absolute king, he won. He deserved to win. And I was just happy to get my little runners up mirable. I was very happy with well that. Well done. It's, it's <laughs> scary. I mean, I actually, I'm not a dad. I'm totally uncoordinated. And um, my daughter's dance school did a dad's dance in 2019, I think it was. <laughs> and I was crapping myself. We did many more. Oh, I never I danced. It. And even before we went out, no one knew it was happening. The students didn't know that but there was an audience of 500. And I'm on the <gasps> side about to go out. I'm going to the dance teacher. I'm not, no, I can't, I can't. She goes, no, you're going. And I went out. <laughs> and it was amazing because it's funny because when you're out there, you don't actually see anyone in the audience. No. So you dark. just do it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm glad I did it. I couldn't do it again. Yeah. <laughs> it was Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's it well, particularly if you're not used to being on stage. Yeah. And it's I a whole other that. world. Yeah. Uh, well done. Oh, uh, good on you. Yeah, I'm glad I did it. Like you said, you yeah. know, you're glad you do it. And um Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Now your book I'll, I'll talk about quickly, which has amazing reviews on Amazon and all over the net. What made oh, you wow. talk like that? There's our oh, great reviews on Amazon. There's like over 200 reviews. Wow, that's great to know. I didn't yeah. know that. Thank yeah. you. 
When, when um, it was finished, um, the publishers, Echo Publishing, um, they did say to me, the ladies took me out for lunch and they said, you know what, it'll be a sleeper. It's not something that's going to go zoom. It's just something that people will tell other people about and it will it will be a sleeper. But that's lovely to know. I'm, I, I did not know that. Yeah, there is. Having said that, no one said to me, well, that or I haven't, you know, heard via. Uh, no one, no one's ever said. Well, that's the biggest load of crap I've ever read, and that's and and it's not in the bargain bin. So, <laughs> like, winner, winner. But what happened, Matt, was um, my manager just approached me one day and said, "I've been approached by Echo Publishing, and they think you should write your memoirs." I'm like, "What? Are you insane?" And like. The furthest thing from my mind, I would, I never contemplated it. I, a few of us at work often joke if something goes awry, we go, oh, that'll go on the memoirs, <laughs> you know, and then promptly forget what we've just said. But I said, I can't do that. I don't have the capacity. I don't have the knowledge. I couldn't sit down and write a book. And they said, don't worry, they will put you with, I'll match you up with a ghostwriter. Uh -huh. And you, the two of you will work on it together. So they introduced me via Zoom, because this was all, you know, in the first lockdown, no. to this lady, um, this lovely young woman called Summer Land, not Summer Bay, <laughs> Summer Land, and and, which was bizarre enough in itself. And um, we just hit it off. Uh, she's um, a, an expat from America, uh, married to a, a country boy, they live out at Mudgee. Actually, two weekends ago, we went up and visited them again oh, wow. and, you know, spend a lot of time drinking wine, eating fabulous food and just, you know, having a good time. Lovely, lovely people. Um, so she and I started talking over Zoom and maybe twice a week and then she would, you know, record it and then, and then she'd write stuff type stuff up and she'd send it to me and then I'd read it and go, oh, that doesn't sound like my voice. So I'd change it a bit and send it back to her and she'd go, that's great. And what about if we do this? And then we'd talk about things or I'd text her in the middle of the night and say, remind me to tell you about the roller skate incident. Yeah. So what I realised that was that memory begets memory. Yeah. So when you start and you look at photo albums and things like that, you're like, oh, my God, I forgot all about that. That was a really important turning point in my life or, you know, I had my heart broken and this person helped me through it and just lots of different memories. So I guess she kind of, you know, found her way through this, this mishmash of, of, of uh, memories and, and thoughts and ideas and put them down and we shared and, you know, she'd send me a chapter and I'd go, oh, I don't know about this. I'm not sure about that. Maybe we could make it sound like this or can we make this longer? And it was just a process that went on, I suppose, for about on and off for about five months. Okay. Wow. And, um, and then I'm just trying to think when it was, we had to have it finished. I had to have it finished. And funnily enough, it was my birthday. It was the 29th of January, 2020, yep. I'm going to say. And then where are we? 22. So maybe 2019 or 20. I can't remember. Um, anyway, um, and then, of course, once they, you know, you have to go through it with a fine tooth comb and make sure nobody's made any mistakes, which the editor does too, but it's nice to do it yourself. Yeah. And then they said, would you do the audio book? And I thought, oh, that'd be fun. Oh, geez, I never shut up. Honestly, <laughs> it like, uh, and it was hard because it's tiring and, and because it's your story, you want to, well, you naturally bring life to it. And something sad that would happen would make me upset again. And then I get all teary. And oh, wow. but the so you it's not just reading someone else's story, you know. And a lot of people have said to me they listened to the audiobook and really enjoyed it. And and the other thing, the other feedback I've had, which is lovely from friends who people who know me, is that they can hear my voice come through the book. Yes. And I think that's everything, really. Um, and there's some shocking things in it. I think there's things in it that people will get, didn't know about me. 
Um, and then there's things that they did know about me and that I, a lot of people said it made them laugh, it made them cry. And I guess that's all you can hope for, you know. Oh, yeah. So all in all, I, I, it's something I'm very pleased with and, and Summer is a queen. Oh, amazing. We'll get a link up on our website to, uh, to your book too. Oh, so thank you. Yes, thank you. Away. Yeah. Mm. Now, I'm sure I, I want to get into Home and Away because I'm being mindful of time, but I'm sure That's you've been right. asked this question a thousand times. Um, Neighbours finishing. Yes. Uh, and I have to say, a few of the Home and Away cast I saw on Twitter, like Shane Withington being one who we've interviewed, who, absolute gentleman, you know. Yeah. About how, you know, how sad it was for the cast and things like yes. that. I thought it was amazing to see the Home and Away cast say that. Um, yes. What, what, are, what are your thoughts on the direction of, TV in Australia, where it's all heading? Um, dramas and look, I think... Platforms. Sorry, I missed that last bit. Streaming platforms and where it's all oh, yeah. Well, do you know what? It's funny you should ask that because about a month ago, um, our boss uh, at Channel 7, the CEO, gathers, gathered us all together, crew and cast, and, and showed us... Um, uh, look, I, I don't have a business brain. And it was some sort of, it was something to do with gathering everyone together. It was a lunch and there wasn't any wine, which I was very upset about. But anyway, um, it was a luncheon where he just presented pro predominantly what Home and Away has done for the economy and what it has done for, you know, a people from overseas coming to Australia. All of those things. And even though I don't have the figures on hand, you could probably Google them and find them. They're astonishing. It is astonishing. The amount of employment hours and years that this show, that Home and Away has given people. And neighbours would fall into the same category. Yeah. Absolutely. But I think at the end of the day, neighbours was being jacked up by... English funds. Yeah. They were being jacked up by English funds and they weren't getting, you know, they it, it wasn't paying off. Yeah. Whereas Home and Away is where a real, very, very important part of Channel 7. Yeah. Financially, we're a very important part of Channel 7. And so people, you know, on Twitter, they say, oh, no, maybe Home and Away will end too. And, and I'm like, well, I don't have a, a crystal ball, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to happen anytime soon or even anytime in the foreseeable future because of what it is and what it does yeah. and how much money it generates for Channel 7. They don't want to lose it because if they suddenly went, oh, no, I'm telling you now, one of the other stations would jump on it yeah. in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat, because they see the value of it. And, and you know, James Warburton is, is a, a, you know, lovely, intelligent man, and he knows. And to be brought together like that and, and to be told all these wonderful figures and, you know, how important the show is. Now, whether or not he just did that off the back of what he realised was happening with Neighbours to reassure everyone, or whether he just went, no, you know what, this is really important for um, for the sponsors to know this too. Yeah, yeah. And um, the figures were extraordinary. Like I, I, I'm not even going to pretend to tell you, but if anyone's interested, you could easily Google them and and find out what they are. And they were astonishing. It was like, no, that can't be right, but it is right. Um, in answer to your question about streaming and and uh, all of the all the rest of it, I think it, there was a stage where it kind of streaming took over and and left a few of us in the wake. But now I think with seven plus and seven two, yeah. you can still watch Home and Away. Yes, like you can watch all of it together. If you can't get home by seven o'clock every night, and you don't want to watch it straight afterwards, you can watch it on a weekend like an omnibus, and. Uh, you know that is still that is still very important and it's still vital and it, and I think that was another thing that James was doing is, is showing people how important free to wear is. Yeah. Because people, you know, you buy your telly and sure if you want to watch, you know, 
the latest thing on Netflix or the latest thing on, on Binge or Disney Plus, then yeah, you can and you pay for it. But if you just want to watch, you know, MKR or um, MasterChef or, or any of those, you know, even reality television, as well as the ABC. and or, I mean, there's so many good television programs on of all ilks uh, that you don't have to pay for. Yeah. And uh, in this economic environment, that's not a bad thing. That's, that's a true. really good thing. You know, you're going to pay $10 for a flip and a lettuce, yeah. you know, really. So, yeah, I think people are looking to save money. And, and that aside, I just think, um, yeah, free to wear is not going anywhere. Yeah. One thing I've really taken away from the whole neighbours thing, and I'm sure it's the same on Home and Away, I'm, I'm 100% it is, is um, we spoke to Zima Anderson recently, who was on Neighbours, and she said it was a real training ground for her neighbours. It was such a training ground to learn yes. from all the older cast members, yes. how they do things. And I'm sure it's yes. the same with, with you on Home and oh, Away. Oh, Home and Away. Well, I mean, you know, one of the usual questions we get asked was, what was it like working with Chris Hemsworth or with, you know, Isla Fisher or, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, and Neighbours has that kind of alumni, alumni yes. too, you know. They have that, of course, you know, Guy Pearce, Natalie and Brulia and, you know, Kylie and Jason and, you know, the list goes on. Um, and... I think a lot of the young ones, I want to say young, younger than me, would say, yes, that was their training ground, yeah. you know. For me, theatre was my training ground, you know. Um, and then I came into television not knowing what the hell I was doing, um, but then learned by watching people like Ray and, and Judy Nunn and, and you know, M, M. Simons and all yeah. of those people who were there when I got there. And um, I absolutely understand how those people like like Chris like you know Guy would say that they they learned and and you know what else it does too and I've heard this funnily enough Kerry Ann, I remember Kerry Ann Kennelly telling me because she knew some producers over in America and we were discussing it and she said you know what happens she said these young ones go over and they audition and they send their, their CV through. As soon as they see Home and Away or Neighbours, they know that these kids have come from a, a, uh -huh. a rigid regime and yeah. that they, have, they do their homework. They have to learn their lines every night. They're on time or they wouldn't last, yeah. you know. They, be, they get their, their, walk, their marching orders. And, um, and that made a lot of sense. So, um, you know, that sort of, it sort of goes before them in a way. I mean, Chris Hemsworth, because, you know, he's the ugliest person on the planet, not. <laughs> um, but, you know, and he's got a gorgeous voice and he's got a fabulous work ethic and he's funny and all of those you know, like My partner at the moment, my partner is, it's her second number two. Oh, it's her, her <laughs> whole past. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Behind the rock. I love it. That's hilarious. I'm third. <laughs> Oh, well, at least you're in the top three, Lon. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, um, I just think that, uh, you know, people like Chris, I'll use him as, as an example because he's probably the most famous ex-home and away person. And um, he, his work ethic um, was second to none. His family life was fabulous and they were, you know, he wasn't spoiled. It was just a normal, you know, one of three brothers and his family, were, they were close and fun. And he was, he was driven and he was focused without being a knob. You know what I mean? He didn't kind of, he just got on with it. He trained in the accent. I remember while he was there and just a lovely kid. And he went over to this, left home and away, went over to the States and within six weeks had been cast. Oh, six weeks. In a film. And it's like, well, that never happens. But, you know, again, his reputation had gone before him and having home and away or neighbours on the top of that CV yeah. is, means a lot to a lot of the um, producers and directors anywhere wow. in the world, really. Yeah, and you guys work, I mean, doing all the prisoner interviews I've been doing, I've, you know, we've done about, I think, 47 now with crew and cast, and 
the, the hard work. I mean, it's yeah. you know, to us, it all just looks easy because you're on screen, but the hard work, I mean, they were talking like 14 hour days, yeah. you know, yeah. rehearsals. Val Lehman was talking about how she'd fly on a Friday night to go to Sydney to do shopping centre appearances on a weekend, mm -hmm. fly back Monday to Prisoner. And, yeah. I mean, they tend not to do them too much anymore, you know. There, there are pluses to COVID. <laughs> but, you know, they're, they, they're hard work. They are really hard work. And you just couldn't do it. I mean, it's like doing, uh, you know, doing, um, say, for example, Perth Telethon, which I do pretty much every year, but the last two years you couldn't do because of COVID. COVID yeah. And even if you could do it, I went down to do the Melbourne one, the, the um, Easter yeah. of Good Friday appeal. So, yeah. And we couldn't go, we couldn't go to um, the hospitals. Yeah. You know, because there's still you've got to be careful. Yeah. And and um that's not a bad thing either, because you know, the young ones kind of pour you a bit and they get excited and everybody wants a hug and it's like, <laughs> no, I don't have that. No, I've managed to avoid COVID touch wood so far. Yeah. I don't want to get it. Same here. So, yeah. So um, but um <laughs> yeah, I think that the hard work uh uh, is evident and and it comes in swings and roundabouts too I know um M Simons who plays Marilyn on the show at the moment she has been hammered the last I would say six weeks she's just had the biggest storyline which funnily enough will be the cliffhanger at the end of the year in England oh okay so yeah, so it's the cliffhanger. So keep, you know, people keep their eyes open for that. And it will be here probably, I reckon, about September, October. It's a big one. And and she's still, because of, you know, because of COVID, people getting sick, they have to change everything all the time. Because of the floods, it, it's affected where we shoot outside. Kenthurst, I think, where the caravan park is, is still underwater. Oh, no. Nice. And even if the water subsides, the the, the yeah. ground can't take the trucks the so trucks. all of that is put on the back burner and we know we're filming stuff we haven't read yet and it's nuts wow. but yeah wow. I use I use Emily and I'm sure she won't mind as an example of someone who has just been smashed and doing like 14 hour days and exhausted wow. but you know it swings and roundabouts and sooner or later she'll get her time off and I'll be smashed <laughs> somebody <laughs> else will be now your time at home. I'm looking at the time. Um, you're right, now. yeah. You're okay, okay. Um, yeah. Now, according to IMBD, which I know can be a little bit inaccurate, you've done over two thousand six hundred thirty-three episodes of Home and Away, taking Good over Lord. from Jackie Phillips in nineteen ninety-three. Now, for the fans that don't know, what happened there? Now, Jackie was playing Irene, and then yeah, Jackie played Irene back, I think, in ninety-one. Oh, yes. 91 or 92. So basically she, I don't know, I never watched the show then, but what, from what I can gather, she, her kids had run away from her. Damien and Finn had run away from her because she was an alcoholic um, and she was mean and she tried to throttle them. And they, she came to the bay and tried to throttle and push them downstairs, whatever, when she was drunk and they, she left. And then for whatever reason, Jackie either didn't want to okay. or couldn't. I don't know what the, the circumstances were, but they decided to bring Irene back. So I auditioned under ridiculous circumstances um, and, um, and got the role. Um, and uh, so I, I remember I, went, I was doing a, uh, an audition for Liz Mulliner down in Melbourne at the old South Melbourne studios yeah, yeah. and I was begging my three children who were actually microphone stands <laughs> and, and Liz was behind reading the lines and filming me <clears throat> and I thought it was going to be a cat you know a cattle call and uh she said at the end of it she was yeah that was pretty good I reckon you might um, you might get this I'm like what this never <laughs> happened but it had come off the back of another audition that I'd done and muddled my way through and they'd seen I think vocally we were similar and and you know we both had gin voices I mean mind you um Jackie makes me sound like a coloratura soprano 
<laughs> which is saying something. Um, but she's, uh, you know, a singer, blues singer. And uh, anyway, yeah, um, the rest was history. I got the role and um, it was a six-month, no, it was a three-month gig. And then um, uh, they said, would you come back in six months for a year? I went, sure, of course I will. And uh, I did. And then at the end of that six months, they said, would you do a year contract? Yeah. And then it went to two, then it went to three, and here we are, here we are. nearly 30 I mean, years later. What an achievement. I mean, and That's you're probably going to do another two and a half thousand, I'm sure. Oh, geez. Uh, I'll be on a Zimmer frame, love. They'll be wheeling me in on the gurney. <laughs> um, you mentioned audition before. Are you a fan of auditions or do you? Look, yeah. they are terrifying. terrifying. And, and, you know, this whole self tape thing, uh, I yeah. have no, I've never had to do that. I don't know what that is. Um, I, I think I should, you know, get someone to, to help me because I don't know what it is. I know that you have to self-tape yourself doing a monologue, I guess, or have someone off screen doing the other, you know, the other voices. And um, But actually auditioning a couple of times, I auditioned once for um, Baz Luhrmann. Oh, wow. um, and... Uh, it, it was fun. Of course, I had the cold from hell. Oh and, God. you know, your voice is up in your head and you can't hear yourself sing. And anyway, um, I, I didn't get the role. But um, I found, funnily enough, and I certainly don't recommend this, but I found that if I really don't care, I'll do really well. I'll, and I'll probably get it. You know when I say really don't care, when it's not life and death, you yeah. know? Like when I went for the home and away one, I went, oh, yeah, well, whatever. Um, it's not life and death. But those ones where you go, oh, my God, I would love this role. I want it so much. That's when you're going to stuff up. That's, That's when yeah. the nerves will take over and stuff like that. So I think for me, the trick is to go, it doesn't matter. You know, just have a good time and get better at, at even at my age, do them because eventually you'll get better at auditioning. Great advice from one of the most famous. Yeah, yeah, because it, it doesn't things. matter, you know. You're not saving humanity if you get the role or you don't get the role, so. Yeah. Now, the next question. Now, in 2019, you were doing an interview with Jonesy and Amanda, who are yes. So good. Love them. I listen to them a lot. Um, yes. Now, you found out that your character, Irene, was going to be written out of the show in 2002, I think. It was. Yes. yes. Or something like that. Two or three. Yeah. Now... <laughs> I, <laughs> I know I know now I had never heard this story and Jonesy goes so I hear you were nearly written out in 2003 I'm like what <laughs> and he said oh yeah apparently the producers couldn't see any you know a way clear to keep you on the show I had no I you know I didn't really know the direction of the character so they were going to write you out but the head writer Coral Drawn like, again, this is all I had knew nothing about this. The head writer, Coral, went marching up and she went, no, you can't write Irene out because I've got some great ideas for her and I think she'll be an integral part for the, the show and she needs to stay and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, of course, this all went, yeah. you know, I had no idea this was going on until Jonesy told me. And I remember getting off air and saying to my partner, Paul, did you know this? And he went on and went, oh, my God, yes, you were nearly boned in, in, two, oh, yes, in yes. 2002, 2003, but Coral saved your bacon. So God bless Coral. Mwah. Yeah, and, and I mean, it. Coral, uh, we've had on three times and she does a regular segment with me each month because she's done so much in yes. the Australian TV yes. industry. Yes. And when I spoke to her about this on her interview, um, I, I swear life is like sliding the movie sliding doors. I, I'm yes. pretty sure you, you've probably seen it, but yes, Coral, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. Coral was nearly not going to take the job on Home and Away. She, wow. Yeah, she was. It was a money thing, and you know they asked if she could come in just to sort of boost the ratings and, and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, there was for a moment she was not going to take it. So wow, it's interesting. To and see. look what happened. <laughs> she, she came on, 
save my bacon, and here I am, 29 years down the track. Yeah. That's fantastic. And oh, she God loved the character. Her. She said there's so many storylines for your character that she had. And she was right. You yeah. know, she was right. And and even though she left a long time ago, you know, we've had people like the lovely Dan Bennett and and um, uh, Hamilton Budd and, and, so, and, and, of course, now Louise Bowes and just so many wonderful, wonderful head writers yeah. um, who are just... And, you know, there's short of an alien invasion, there's only so many things that can happen <laughs> to a human being. You know what I'm saying here? Like you can have a sinkhole, it's pretty bizarre, although after the floods, not so bizarre. Um, you can have a sinkhole, you can have an explosion, you can have a tsunami, you can have an earthquake. Pretty much we've had them all. Yes, I would say that. You can have a heart condition. You can have cancer. Uh, you can have, you know, there's a, a myriad of things that can happen to a human being. And like I say, with the exception probably of war and alien invasion, everything has happened to people on, on in <laughs> Summer Bay. And you wouldn't live there for quits, would you? Seriously. <laughs> like, <laughs> but... It's you never get bored. You never ever get bored because there's always something around the corner. Yeah. And and I always joke. I think I mentioned this in the book too a, a few years ago. A lovely Courtney Miller, who's now I believe down in Melbourne, maybe at BCA, and she's an artist and she had got her painting on my wall. Um, she played Belle Bella on the show, and. Um, she, her character was getting groomed online, really important storyline. Yeah. And I'd gone to a wedding. I think it was Robbo and, and Jazz's wedding, came home and here's this guy attacking her. And Irene lost it and bludgeoned him with a, a lamp and something else. And then we thought he was dead and we put the body in the boot and we went late, took him to the hospital. He recovered and, and it was this entire storyline about, um, about, uh, child um, abuse because Irene had been abused and that came out really important stuff and gets people talking and thinking and um, but I guess um, my point is is that at that stage of me being in home and away I hadn't done much for a while and I walked up the stairs to the office and I said to Louise the head writer and to, to Lucy the producer I'm a bit bored just making coffees is there <laughs> You know, is there any storyline for Irene coming up? They went, oh, well, funny you should ask. Wow. And then the next six months I was smashed and I went, right, that's it. I am never walking up those stairs again, <laughs> ever. I'm content to, you know, to, to comfort other people in their in their hour of need and to make coffee. That'll do me just dandy because I it was so hard. And, and really like gut wrenching and just yeah. having to be hysterical at 7.30 at the, in the morning and, you know, not shooting things chronologically, which happens all the time, but just very difficult, a really hard journey. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the writers like Coral um, are just worth their weight in gold and such an interest, because if they didn't come up with the ideas, yeah. you know, and and there would be no stories to tell. Do you ever you know? get to suggest ideas? Do you have ideas that you can go to a writer and say, oh, oh yes. Storyline's great. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I do. Um, yeah. I, not very often, but I occasionally people will have ideas and go up and talk to them and say, like, especially if you get a guestie in uh, who's great and you love working with them um, and, um, and then they leave and then you go, oh, what a shame. They were so good. You know, maybe if this happens and then that happens, even if they leave on bad terms, you yeah. can there's still a way you can get them back in, you know. And I remember Cameron Daddo, he played um, uh, Lucas's, Lucas, uh, who played Ryder. Cameron played the dad <clears throat> and had a, had a, a love affair with uh, Georgie's character, Rue. And then he left or he died or something. And then Georgie was like, oh, man, he was such a good character. So they bought in his twin. Oh, the twin. Yeah. The twin came back. So you always that's bring a twin. Right. You can always bring the twin in. <laughs> the twin. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, yeah, look, um, I, I just feel, I guess, bottom line, I just feel so blessed. 
who have had such great work over so many years and, uh, you know, no signs of slowing down anytime soon. No, it's great. It's, uh, I mean, you're, you're so iconic on the screens and you're such a brilliant <laughs> actress. One thing oh, I want to ask about is um, one thing about Home and Away, as I noticed, which I think is great that we sort of overlook, is that it, it does teach, you know, you talk about the grooming online and things like yeah. that. I mean, you know, if kids are watching that, they'll say, oh, whoa, yeah. wow, you know, like it's, yeah. that's what it's also doing. Is and it can also, it can start conversations 100%. at home. I mean, look, we are 7 p.m. Yeah. And I think we really push the boundaries. <laughs> I was going to mention. Um, I mean, you know, just in terms of oh, sex and drugs and rock and roll, you know, we push yeah. the boundaries. But then some really important issues like, you know, grooming of children online. So that that can start up a whole education, a whole conversation Definitely. with mum and dad and the kids. Um, also too, I mean, home and away, not so much, but neighbours certainly dealt with beautifully gay relationships, transgender, that sort of thing. Um, and that can start up conversations too. I mean, we're, we're in the 21st century now. It's like, you know, unless you live in cotton wool, you know, by the time you're eight or nine or 10, you know about these things. And I think it's important that it's, it's represented on screen. And even if, if somebody's not sure about how they are feeling, if a young kid's not sure about how they're feeling in themselves, then they can see something on screen and go, okay, it, it's okay, they're accepted. And maybe talk to their, their family about it, you know. I just think, um, you, you know, there's so many areas where shows like Neighbours and Home and Away have, I think, reflected society and presented the opportunity for conversation. Yeah, I 100% agree. And then, you know, you're a part of all that, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, got a, I've got a question about fame. Now, I've, I've spoken to a few cast members from The Sopranos who I'm friends with and we've done some interviews and fame is an interesting question. Um, you know, that one was talking about he'd been on Sopranos for a few years and then, uh, you know, he's out shopping, doing his shopping and he has fans coming up to him going, what, why, why are you shopping? And you, you know, you'd, you'd be one of the most recognised faces on Australian TV and without a doubt. So I'm sure... You probably go to Coles or Woolworths, or do you have butlers that are doing your shopping for you? I mean, that's what fans. Of course, say. can't you see them all milling <laughs> around me now? I oh, know. Look, um, yeah, it does happen, and uh, particularly out of towners. I mean, I go to my local, um, my local uh, Woolies, or my local Coles, or my local um, IGA, or you know, Audi, whatever, and uh, and I go to my local shopping centre, and. Locals see you, they know you're a local. But the out-of-towners are like, what are you doing here? It's like, <laughs> I'm shopping. They're like, why? Well, because if I don't eat, I'll die. And my partner's really bad at shopping. He just comes home with corn chips and Tim Tams, so I need to buy vegetables. And they're like, oh, you know, they, they can't deal with the fact that you just have a, a, a normal life. You know, um, and I can only imagine somebody from The Sopranos, what people must go, yeah. why are you in, you know, your local whatever? Hilarious. Yeah, it was a real funny story. But, I mean, yeah. it must get a bit, after a while, fame. I mean, you know, you said it was such a busy life with working on Home and Away and you just want to go and do some shopping or do, yes. you know. Do you just shopping. live a normal life. Look, yeah. um, it, I, I've got to admit I'm really not the best at it. Um, my friend Ada is always horrified by the way I behave. Like, for example, at airports, when we just got back from the Logies and we look like a bucket of pork. And, <laughs> and now these people come up and go, can we have photos? And I'm always the one that goes, look, it's not a good time. Sorry. But do you mind? We just, we look like, and I just like horrified that I say no. But sometimes, and, and it happened actually recently, we were filming it was so funny. We were filming up in Young. It's it's common knowledge. We were we went up there, and and this is where we're filming the um, the cliffhanger for England at the end of the year. And there wasn't a lot of places open at night, and we'd go across to the RSL, and you know we were 
getting brave and ordering the oysters and the schnitty and all that. It was lovely. Yeah. Anyway, this one night, I think it was the last night we were in town and we'd been working very hard and very long hours and we just wanted a wine and a schnitty and, and this guy's drunk guy came up yes. and, he, and he goes, <clears throat> can I have a photo? To, this is more to Ray who was opposite me. Ray was opposite me and, and Ada was next to me. Can I have a photo, Al? And and Ray literally <laughs> got from Al this huge gobful of seafood linguine. Like he wasn't talking anything to anybody till he ate. And I was like, excuse me, but can you um, do you mind coming back when we're once we're um uh once we've finished eating? And it's like, uh, hold on to your hat, Ailsa. It's all right. I was like, what? He goes, I only want a photo without. Anyway, I don't watch the show. And honestly, I'm, I'm, can I swear? Because yeah, this is really, I went, I'm going to have to say the F off because yeah. I did. I said, well, you can just F off. <laughs> and meantime, Ray's gone, hmm, 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 wondering what's going on. Ada's like slid under the table. Ah, oh, keep your hat on now. So anyway, in the end, Ray, to his credit, so gracious, got up, had a photo, still picking bits of linguine oh out of his bed, had a photo with this numpty. I was <laughs> furious. I just thought, I don't care if you're drunk. Have a little bit of common decency. I was polite. I just said, can you wait until we've finished eating and we'd love to have a photo. Loved was probably a bit at the top, but I did say those words. Ah, yeah. oh, keep your hat on, Alsa. I mean, I can forgive that because Judy and Nan and I are very alike, not. Um, I, look, I can forgive that. She is probably horrified to think that somebody thought I was her. Um, and um, I get all of that, but to, that's when I'm not very good. I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at drawing that line between... Count to one, as somebody just once said to me, you don't even have to get to 10, just count to one and breathe and then say, all right, yes, that'll be fine if you're not going to listen to me. But I just went, well, you can just F off. <laughs> Ray's like, what is going on? Anyway, that was my experience in Young. There was only one guy and he was just a pain in the butt. Yeah. So, can so I, um... I'm not... I'm, that's I'm not very good at it, Matt, at the end of the day. If I'm in a good mar in a good mood, well, you oyster. But if I've had it a day yes. or, a, you know, a night or a, um, something's going on in my life, I'm not very, I can't juggle that very well, even now after 29 years. Yeah. So if I've ever abused anyone out there, I'm so sorry. It's probably because I was having a really bad day. Come up to me again if I look like I'm going to be nice. <laughs> But I mean, it's we don't. I guess we don't on our side. It's you know we don't see the big days you guys put in, and you know you're working the fourteen hour days. And I mean, it must yeah. be so tough that you've just you want to go out and have dinner. You just had a big day. You have got big story yeah. coming up. You're remembering yep. lines. You've got so much. Yep. Going on. Then your normal life at home. On That's top of right. That. And I mean, and look, <laughs> even though I've given you a, a, a extreme example. Ada would disagree, but most of the time I'm good and nice and polite. Yeah. But and you know, when you get kids, young schoolgirls who are terrifying, but when they come up and they go, Excuse me, Lynn, and you go, Oh God, do I know these people? Because usually you get Irene, excuse me, Lynn, would you be would you mind having a photo with us? I'm delighted. Yes, yes. But when they try and do this thing, you know, with the phone, where they pretend they're taking a photo. Yeah. Oh, sorry, they pretend they're texting, but they're really taking a photo of you picking chicken out of your teeth. I was like, <laughs> I lose I it. Yes. I lose it. So like, have the courtesy to come up and ask if you can have a photo, like old drunk mate <laughs> in young, <laughs> and then be told to whip off. No. I love that. Um, can I fit in two more questions? I know we've gone sure. out of time. But, sure, sure. Um, playing Irene for so long, what has Irene taught Lynn? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. Um, look, despite what I just said, I think, I think she's probably taught her to be a bit more long-suffering 
and a bit more patient, despite what I just said. <laughs> um, I think she's taught her to be, I think she's taught me to be a little more caring and a little less judgmental. I think that would be the big wow. one. I really do try not to be judgmental and just think, you know, everyone's got their story and you can't see that story. Yeah. Um, you don't know what's going on in somebody's life. So I think to be, to be kind and accepting doesn't always happen. Uh, case in point, young. <laughs> but um, it, it, I think, yes, that's a, a lesson that I've learned over the years, to just remember that everyone's got dealing with their issues, even though you can't see it, you know, on them. That's true. Wow. Love that. Finally, um, the ending for Irene. I, I did read somewhere that you would be hoping to go out like Molly from a country. Yes, country, yes. Which, I mean, that is the most famous death on a street. Iconic, country. yeah. Well, Irene's a, a, a breast cancer survivor. So if she were to ultimately die of, of breast cancer, um, I, I think that, I would love that. You know, that's just Lynn's ego going. I would love people weeping and wailing for me. Um, mind you, there might be people around going, yes, finally. No, I don't, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, But, um, yeah, I think so. Or maybe even if I, you know, down the track I were to leave, something a little open-ended, like maybe, um, maybe I disappear at sea. Something like that, yeah. you know. Um, so, you know, a boat sinks and and the body's never recovered, but maybe I'm washed up on a on a atoll somewhere, and you know, eventually come back so as some back sort like of Harold thing. Like Harold on Neighbours. Pardon? You come back Did like Harold on Neighbours. Oh yes, yeah, <laughs> like, like Harold Holt. That was so. Uh, that was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. That, I mean, it, Harold on Neighbours. That was an amazing storyline. Yes. But yeah, Harold Holt. I mean, what? Wow, that's oh yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think um, I don't know. I'm, I, 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 it would be definitely a conversation. I'd have to walk up those stairs from hell <laughs> and have a conversation with the writers about that down the track. Yeah, amazing. Because no, quite frankly, I can't see the show ending. No, no. Anytime soon, and people ask that. A lot of people are worried. And it's like it's they're com com completely different kettles of fish. Yeah, it's it's actually the, the impact that na you know neighbors finishing. I'm I'm in all the Facebook groups with neighbors mm -hmm. coming away and everything because I, I post the announcements for our interviews and things. And you know, people like some of those neighbors fans were like dire straits. They're like that that sh you know these shows get me through life. Like, yes, I know. I get that. I, I get that. I think. Neighbors. Yeah. I mean, I was upset when Hacks finished. <laughs> and that was only like two series of a half an hour episodes. Um, but I, I do get that that people, it's like when a really good book finishes, you go, well, well then what happens? Yeah. You know, write some more. Um, so I totally understand that. And I would love to see another Australian, I won't say soap, but, you know, a really accessible um, family time, uh, family viewing time series get launched. I think, yeah. you know, we've got wonderful stories out there to tell, you know, and we've done it over the years with like a country practice and, 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 and all saints and, you know, flying doctors and just recently RFDS, which is wonderful. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got your more serious stuff, which I love, Newsroom and um, newsroom. Uh, Total Newsroom's wonderful. And one of the girls, I found this out, and it's public knowledge, one of the girls yesterday um, put on uh, Philippa Northeast, who played one of the twins on, on Home and Away, uh, I'm going back about six years, seven years ago, she's been cast Oh wow! In the new newsroom, and I'm so thrilled for her. That is a real coup. Um, and of course, Anna Torv, she's a goddess, and what a wonderful actress. And you know, I, I hadn't actually seen it, and we interviewed Mel Walden, a, oh, probably about six months ago. Oh yeah, he brought it up, 
and you know if mel's recommended the newsroom you've got to watch it <laughs> oh oh you have to look uh, you know it, and if people mm -hmm. out there haven't watched it it is a truly great australian uh drama as is total control as is to, uh, uh mystery road you know there, there's so many out there but yeah. i guess it that na neighbor's niche you know a bit like the home and away that you know that the, the neighbors is such a great concept i mean and it, it stems from the poms doesn't it east enders emma dale you know yeah. coronation street all of that it, it stems sure. from that but we have so many stories to tell so hopefully when you, see, out there. when you see shows like the newsroom and things and i'll let you go so i know you're very busy but um the newsroom do you think i'd love to be on that for a few episodes do you oh, have yes. the ability with yes. a way that you can you know go and well, audition i mean they're not great about us going and doing something on channel nine or channel 10 course, but yeah. i reckon the abc sbs the abc and and potentially um uh, oh and of course even you know like foxtel and all of those yeah. um as long as it wasn't up against home and away at the same time slot i i think they're they're smart they're smart the producers and you know if you love someone set them free and they will come back I could I definitely see you on shows like that. The new oh, I'd love to do something like that. Oh, my gosh, yeah. that'd be great. That'd be great. Um, yeah. Um, if you ever want to come back for a second interview, please let me know. I, I had oh, thank you, love. You've been amazing. Um, if you told me when I was a kid watching you grow up that I'd be interviewing you at the age of 44, uh, I would never have believed you. Um, bless you. You're beautiful, amazing, and... Um, yeah, love seeing you on our screens and and all you know Thank all the you. other work you do as well, not just home and away. Thank you. Mental health and and. Oh, thank other, you so yeah, much. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely. Um, well, it's been a great pleasure, love, and you know, like, oh, ask an actor to talk about themselves. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> that's what I love we do. it. <laughs> just lo I love learning about the lives. I mean, just oh, that's great. Growing up thank and how you. your career started and and everything. Yeah. Uh, lovely yeah well thank you and and if you haven't read the book please read it i think you'd be you know you'd really yeah, enjoy I'm going it. to read it and uh, we'll lovely. put it up on our website as well so lovely thank you thank you thank okay you. we'll see you soon all the best love Thanks yeah so take care I'll love to everyone care. out there you bye see. darling bye bye that was episode 13 of Talking Prisoner Presents. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and share this interview where you can. And this episode of Talking Prisoner Presents with Lynn McGranger will also be up on all the podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple, Amazon, iHeartRadio, Google, and wherever you get your pod podcast platform from, and also up on the talkingprisoner.com website. Thank you so much for watching.